Okay, good morning and a warm welcome to this course which goes by the name Instability and Patterning of Thin Polymer Films. This is a course we offer at the Chemical Engineering Department at IIT Kharagpur as an, as an elective for the master's students as well as an open elective for the final year undergraduate students. Uh, you might be slightly surprised with the name because I am sure in your chemical engineering curriculum you have not come across uh, a course that goes by this type of a name. Well, don't be scared, uh, it, it's a course as you will soon find which is extremely or highly interdisciplinary in nature and covers various aspects of chemical engineering, physics, nanotechnology and even some concepts of polymer chemistry and polymer physics. So, let us see how we propose to progress uh, in this course or how we sort of make a, uh, ma how, how we plan to unfold the story. Uh, since uh, the area is relatively new to you, so we will go in for an extended introduction so that I can give you some glimpses what patterns are. And then uh, we talk about what type of patterns we are talking about. Primarily patterns can be at any length scale, but we will be uh, in the context of this particular course talking about meso and nanoscale patterns. Uh, then uh, probably what we take up in the first lecture in greater details is the application of such pattern surfaces and films. Uh, in order to make progress, we need some basic introduction on some basic concepts, uh, some of which will be say surface tension, Young's equation, uh, dispersion forces, concepts, basic concepts of hydrophobicity and hydrophilicity. Then I will uh, introduce you to the concept of Young Laplace equation, which essentially is related to the pressure difference or pressure gradient that ex exists uh, across a uh, non planar interface. Uh, as you have seen from the name of the course itself, uh, there are two apparently distinct aspects one is instability and one, in pa one is patterning. Well, these two are in a way distinct, but in a way they are very closely related. Uh, out of the two words, probably patterning is something you are more familiar with. So, our initial discussion will be on patterning and how to make these patterns. Uh, but we also would uh, eventually introduce at that point, uh, at this point of time, the concept of what instability is and what type of instability we are talking about. There are some well known instabilities, for example, the Rayleigh Taylor instability, the Safman instability, and things like that. Uh, so, some of the uh, intro concepts we will introduce. You will also at this point uh, understand what exactly leads to the so called very well known phenomena of capillary rise. Continuing with our discussion, we will then touch upon the basic patterning techniques at the meso and or the I would say surface patterning techniques. Uh, we will talk in very brief details uh, about uh, the basic concepts of photolithography which all the people who are well accustomed with the electronics and microelectronics micro electronics industry are extremely well uh, accustomed with. But then since this course covers uh, or we will be focusing in greater detail on polymer uh, surfaces and patterns. So, we will I will introduce at this, this point of time the basic concept of soft lithography, uh, which is uh, still a very new concept uh, invented sometime in the middle of 90s by primarily almost parallelly I would say by two groups, one at Princeton and one at Harvard. The, the two biggest names are Stephen Chow at Princeton and uh, White Sides at Harvard. And uh, we will talk about some of the soft lithography methods in details, some of which include nano imprint lithography, which, which is internationally famous now by the acronym NIL, uh, capillary force lithography, CFL, micro molding in capillaries, uh, which goes by the acronym MIMIC, micro contact printing, better known as MUCP. There are several other and various variants of all these soft lithography techniques, uh, which we will discuss in somewhat detail. And then we will also show or talk about other uh, patterning methods, which allows you to make structures probably at lateral resolution of around 10 nanometer, uh, but some of which are I mean, more intense. So, some of the methods can be deep pen nanolithography, which uses an atomic force microscope platform or the other type of direct write methods. Uh, now, the other thing is we talk about making structures and features which are very, very small, which are some micron, or I mean soon I will explain what is exactly is a meso scale, but typically you can understand we are planning to make structures which are very, very small. So, something like tens of nanometer to a few, few uh, micron maybe. So, one of the critical issue is once you even, once you make these structures, how really do you see or check for yourself that these structures have been made in the desired fashion. Uh, because 
if the first thing that comes to our mind, uh, uh, what one uses for seeing very small features is the optical microscope. But for these type of structures, many cases the optical microscope fails to resolve because of their smallness. So there are other high end microscopy techniques, uh, scanning electron microscope, transmission electron microscope and a particular microscopy technique again which was invented in mid middle of 80s. Uh, is the atomic force microscopy, a very, very specialized type of a microscope specifically used for looking at surfaces and features with very small lateral resolution. I guess this course will be a good, uh, uh, I mean to introduce the concept of AFM or the atomic force microscopy at some point in this course will be a good idea. So we will look into how the atomic force microscope works. Once I explain it, you will realize it is a very simple concept and based on which uh, a lot, lot of things can be done. We will be extensively talking about surface tension and other related phenomena. So, one of the key instrument that is necessary to determine surface tension of a liquid or that of a sub solid or the interfacial tension is uh, the, the instrument called goniometer. Uh, the method is known as the contact angle goniometry. We will also briefly introduce you to that concept. Then we will eventually start talking in details about the instability and we will be primarily talking about thin film instability. So, first we will try to classify a thin film based on interaction forces or dispersion forces as it uh, turns out and we will show that essentially for this context at least we will regard films which are about thinner than about 100 nanometer to be thin films. Why, why this classification, why this number or from where this magic number 100 nanometer comes up we will try to discuss that because you might have heard the word thin film in various contexts. So, the first thing that comes to your mind is some sort of a coating. But most of the coating like the paint in the wall or something like that that you see around us are actually much, much thicker. So, it is rather vague that way, I mean how really you classify a film to be thick or thin. We will try to address this issue and as I, as I said for the context of this particular course at least and many other contexts we will show that a film that is less than about 100 nanometer uh, possesses some uh, ex, uh, additional properties or unique properties which are not present in films thicker than that. This is also some sort of a basic basis for various uh, phenomena or very various magical phenomena uh, which are seen in a very popular area these days which is nanotechnology. I mean you must try to think of or you must wonder what exactly makes nanotechnology so very special. So, we will touch upon some of those uh, fundamental aspects. We will also talk about the concept of excess free energy of interaction present in a thin film. And of course, if you talk about thin film and if you really want to make them, we need to know how these type of thin films can be made. Uh, primarily in this method, this way I will touch upon uh, two of the basic techniques uh, which are uh, spin coating and dip coating. So, once we cover these aspects of thin film, thin film instability, we will move on to the hydrodynamics of a free surface which eventually will give us the formalism to talk about the thin film in an ultra thin liquid, uh, the instability in an ultra thin liquid film, uh, where you will see that your chemical engineering concepts of fluid dynamics, fluid as a continuum, Navier-Stokes equation, etc., become important. So, all we will do is or all we will consider is the Navier-Stokes e equation under the so called lubrication approximation. I will take that up in greater detail, so then you will realize how your chemical engineering concepts actually bridge rather well with what we are going to talk here. We will also introduce you to the, I will also introduce you to the concept of linear stability analysis, a very well known concept which uh, is again used in various other aspects of uh, chemical engineering. For example, to understand the stability of a CSTR uh, and based on linear stability analysis, we will show what are the necessary conditions for instability. Linear stability analysis also gives certain other, other parameters like the dominant wavelength of instability or the initial time scale, etc., which we will take up at that point of time. Uh, we then talk about in greater detail about the spontaneous rupture and deviating of thin liquid films, which uh, often are uh, often goes by the name the spinodal instability of a thin liquid film. Uh, this type of instability, understanding this type of instability is extremely important in various contexts because these instabilities can be extremely detrimental from the standpoint of a uh, coating. So, from the standpoint of coating one would try to suppress these type of instabilities as much as possible, but these instabilities are also associ associated with morphological evolution which can also turn out to be some sort of a viable technique for patterning. So, we will talk about in details uh, about the morphological evolution sequence 
there are some critical issues you might want to remember some of the headers, rim formation and rim shape and based on uh, looking at the shape of the rim one can actually get back or have an idea about the level of viscoelasticity of the polymer melt or the polymer film or the liquid film we are talking about. And then uh, we will talk about something very, very interesting that is on ordering of the instability patterns by templating. That is, this is actually the area where uh, you can see that uh, the two concepts of patterning and instability starts getting merged. And this I must tell you, this is a very advanced area, a uh, lot of uh, high end research is still going on uh, presently. So, I will introduce you to some of the state of art concepts. Now, once this uh, spontaneous instability in a liquid thin film is over, we will talk about some more uh, instability settings in polymer films or liquid films, uh, some of which we uh, includes electrohydrodynamic instabilities in thin polymer films, elastic contact instability in another type of polymer films which are not liquid, but are, are of the form of a soft solid elastic film at room temperature or these are the these are films which exhibit room temperature elasticity. Uh, to sum up, we will also, I will also introduce you to another very important concept of uh, uh, that is being investigated these days, which it is polymer blend thin films. So, where you have essentially have two different polymers which are immiscible to each other and you try to cast a film uh, to find out what exactly happens. There are lots of additional physical interaction that comes in and which determines the morphology of the as cast film as well as uh, the how the morphology changes or evolves uh, with progress of annealing or heating and we will sum it up sum up the course with conclusion and future prospects but uh, please do remember that this is a co this is a pretty open ended course it's not a very classical course i mean lot of developments are happening even today and uh, i'll be happy after going through this course contents if some of you decide to go for academics you will find in various areas of high end academics in universities or iits in india as well as abroad the uh, lot of activity uh, is going on on these type of uh, areas so, I hope you, you will enjoy and you will have a nice time with this particular course. So, let us uh, uh, proceed further. Uh, in the very first slide, I have given my contact details including emails. So, after reading, if after at, uh, attending these lectures, if you find any difficulty, you are free to email me and I will try to clear your doubt as much as possible. Uh, texts, well, uh, not too many standard textbooks are available because as I told the uh, course content is uh, pretty recent and it is still evolving. However, still a uh, few books are available in the market. Uh, uh, for example, the one uh, generation of micro and nano patterns on polymeric materials. It is a very recent book published in 2011, edited by Del Campo and Arts. It is a Wiley VCH publication. Uh, Nanolithography and patterning techniques in microelectronics. Part of it, uh, it though it talks about microelectronics, uh, part of uh, the book covers uh, patterning of polymers as well. It is uh, published around 2006 or 7 from CRC Press. Uh, nanolithography, okay, uh, it is repeated unfortunately. Okay, uh, I would also strongly uh, request you to make a culture of referring to the top notch journals, for example. Lot of these activities are published in, in, in some of the journals because it is uh, very new. So, some of the journals you may want to look up would be Nature, Nature Materials, Science, Langmuir, Applied Physics Letters, Advanced Materials, Advanced Functional Materials, Small macromolecules, etc. So, with these and uh, some of the uh, references available on the, uh, you can also refer, I mean this is one thing I must tell you, you, you are free to refer Wikipedia at, at the drop of a hat because that is really uh, uh, one site from which you get lot of basic information and you can augment that with whatever I am talking and teaching here, so that the things become understandable. But uh, one thing I can tell you that once you attend this course, you will be happy to correlate many of the things you see in and around you happening in nature, which apparently with your uh, classical engineering knowledge, you fail to understand or have never thought in detail about what or why exactly it is happening. So, that is the prime intention I have to show you that uh, many of the phenomena that you see around us uh, in nature in the biological world as well as in the as well as in the inanimate world as well as in some of the artificially fabricated materials or commodities we use these days these type of patterns and features have a very important and key role to play so now let's get going with the formal introduction of the course first try to understand what is patterns well if i define or not really doesn't matter we all understand what patterns are there's some sort of an ordered uh, thing 
Okay, so you can have patterns, you can draw nice patterns or you can uh, have nice patterns on your dress or objects can be made in, in, a, in uh, to form a particular pattern. If you go by the Wikipedia definition, well pattern uh, it is derived from the French word patron which refers to a type of theme of recurring events or objects sometimes referred to as an element of a set of objects. We probably understand what it means. So these uh, whatever images you see, uh, some of them are taken from the Wikipedia, some of them are my own images, they are all different patterns. So for example, this is the first one is some sort of a design, the second one we all know it is a simple checkboard, third one is a formation of fighter aircrafts that is also some, some type of a pattern. Fourth one is birds returning home towards the evening, they also if you have noticed carefully looked at the sky, they come back in some sort of a, some sort of a pattern. So this is also definitely a pattern. Fifth one is a nice example of a housing complex, here the architecture is such that it also forms some sort of a nice order. Even uh, while entering the interior of an aircraft, if you see that the seats are arranged in some sort of order, that is also some sort of a pattern you see. India, we come from India, so classical dance from I think this is Kuchipudi or Bharatnatyam, I am not very sure about it. But here you see all the ladies are pretty much standing in the same desired style, so that also is some sort of a pattern undoubtedly. So you can uh, see that patterns can be everywhere in and around us, try to explore, is, you say, explore around you, you will find patterns. I am very sure many of you the shirts or the dresses you are wearing has some nice designs and which are uh, sort of self repeating, so they are also patterned. For example, the one I, I am wearing of course has some uh, cross patterns of course. Moving on, we can also talk about or find various examples of pattern in nature in and around you. Peacock, our national bird for example, beautiful color, we all love to see dancing peacocks, but have you ever thought what really makes us so fascinated about peacocks and it is their beautiful design uh, on their, uh, uh, on them which, which makes us, makes the peacock so beautiful. Uh, peacocks, mushroom gills, shell, uh, even a cobweb net, honeycomb, the beautiful color of a butterfly, the out, uh, the sort of outlook of a zebra or even a tiger for example or even snowflakes. If you look at them, many of them have some sort of a self repeating feature or patterns. So its patterns is not really limited to artificial formation of houses or uh, aircraft, uh, array, uh, the way aircrafts are flying, uh, patterns you can see are present at all length scale and in and around us uh, in everywhere. But in the context of this particular course, we will be interested, oh, okay, the further, further uh, you may note that patterns can not only be spatial, but it can also be temporal. So it may not be, the, the examples we have shown so far are all sorts of spatial patterns where the, the repetition is in space, but one can have repeating patterns in time. For example, the diurnal motion of earth itself is a classic example of temporal pattern. Every morning the sun rises and every evening it sets, so it is also a regular pattern which is uh, associated to the biological clock of our bodies. Patterns can also be partially ordered, for example, if you look at this picture of this beautiful nebula, you see there is some sort of a pattern, there is something at the center and things are exploding or expanding. But if you look carefully, it is not exactly 100% uh, symmetrical, you really from your engineering concept probably cannot draw a central line to locate the symmetry, the plane of symmetry. But still, uh, if you have a casual look, there are patterns. So, the idea I would like to impress upon you that patterns can be absolutely ordered or they can be partially ordered also. Uh, moving on, however, what we would intend to talk in this particular course is patterns at meso and nano scale which are present on the surface. I am sure all of you by now understand what exactly a nanometer means, it is 10 to the power minus 9 meter. Meso scale is sort of a word that is used to sort of define length scales that varies between few to hundreds of nanometer. So tens of nanometer to couple of micron is what we will regard as mesoscale in the context of this particular uh, uh, course. Uh, here essentially we talk about patterns present on the surface of an ob object that can lead to exotic properties. What I mean by exotic, these uh, unique properties are not related to the chemical structure or formulation of the material but results due to the presence of these uh, surface features on the object. Typically we know that something is uh, uh, tough, for example metals or uh, something is shining and plastics are not, plastics are soft. These properties originate from the bulk properties, okay. 
but what we are going to talk here is some properties which do not which are not directly related to the bulk properties but they originate because of the presence of structures or patterns on their surface which are apparently exotic or unique properties so many of the ex ex extraordinary properties uh, observed in nature are also attributed to presence of such patterns one of the key research uh, in the, uh, key intention is in these areas is to somehow mimic those functionalities which are already available in nature and i will give you some examples of that artificially so in order to achieve that uh, making these type of patterns become important that is the what we are going to cover in the first part of our talk in addition it may be possible to achieve extraordinary properties which are never found of uh, found in nature by artificially patterning a surface for example uh, i don't know how many of you have already heard but you are free to do a wikipedia search uh, there is this concept of meta materials uh, which are also known as the negative refractive index materials which uh, sort of promises that cloaking or invisibility will soon be possible maybe in a few years time now these type of materials uh, are not available in nature but they are artificially being explored and the entire progress in these areas is attributed significantly uh, to the presence of surface patterns or patterning methods uh, progressing further uh, patterns with sub micron and nanometer resolution uh, find application in host of important areas some of which are optics uh, microelectronics one of the key and the most significant users of patterning i'll give you some examples on this uh, structural superhydrophobicity lotus leaf effect what is it is also known as many of you probably know so when we touch upon this area you will realize what i'm talking about uh, a lot of application in biology and biotechnology uh, so what we are going to talk essentially is some structures like this so here you see yeah, the scale bar here is 10 micron and you have some 7 8 lines so the lines are around 700 or 800 nanometer wide and they are separated by a similar sort of a distance uh, these type of figures you will see a lot in this course this is an afm image which is an atomic force micro so this type of image you see when you try to investigate a sample under an atomic force microscope as i have told you in the introduction part that we will cover uh, how an atomic force microscope works or something like that just to give you a comparison uh, about the length scale of these lines what you are seeing on your screen a human hair probably one of the thinnest thing or narrowest thing we know is 50 micron so that is roughly 500 times of these structures uh, i'm sorry it's a roughly about 50 times uh, thicker than each of these lines what you are seeing on your screen so we are actually planning to talk or we are going to talk about these type of structures which are very very narrow small very small laterally and so you can imagine making these structures become non trivial at times and also investigating them as to how they have formed and whether they have formed accurately also becomes challenging which we i will give you some glimpses how to do that so that is precisely what we will do in the initial part of the course we will focus on how some of structures or patterns can be created and we will specifically emphasize on polymeric materials so let's talk about some of the applications of pattern surfaces one of the key application is the concept of structural superhydrophobicity don't be sort of scared with the name or something like that we all know about the lotus leaf effect uh, a lotus uh, uh, grows on the surface of a pond and the uh, tree sort of spreads on the pond however if you drop uh, a drop of water on this uh, leaf what happens is the drop simply rolls off rolls off like a metallic ball i am sure many of you have seen this application or seen this uh, phenomena occurring uh, this as it turns out that this uh, ability of a drop of water to roll freely on the surface of a lotus leaf as well as on the surface of many other biological entities or objects some of which include some other leaves and plants including grass actually as well as bird feather for example is not attributed due to the specific property of the leaf or the plant but is because of the fact that there exist some very tiny structures or humps on the surface of these plants so what it makes that instead of the droplet sitting on a flat surface it now sits on a corrugated or a patterned surface and as you can see in the schematic here which we will take up in greater detail subsequently uh, once we um, move a, uh, we uh, we are through for a couple of lectures is the wetting regime changes i mean these are these are critical concepts i will talk in greater detail 
So, you can see instead of the drop for example, in figure A schematic figure A instead of the drop sitting in cohesive contact with the surface, there can be isolated air pockets present between the liquid drop and uh, the surface or the substrate. Uh, so, these uh, entrapped air pockets sort of aid in, in this type of a rolling phenomena uh, or really rolling of these drops. Now, this is something uh, what is called uh, the area of superhydrophobicity or structural superhydrophobicity. It is a very important area, lot of research, advanced research is going on. Uh, one of the offshoots of this area is the so called concept of self cleaning surfaces, which I will again talk in a little uh, detail in, in, in subsequently very soon. Uh, coming back to your chemical engineering concepts. We all know about uh, condensation in, we have all studied about condensation in our heat transfer courses and we know that there exist two types of condensation, film type condensation and drop wise condensation. And I am sure from your heat transfer concepts you also know that from the standpoint of heat transfer film type condensation is preferred over the drop wise condensation because in film type condensation uh, the condensing liquid or condensing vapor which let us say is in this area has uh, does not have a direct access to the. Uh, cold surface on which it is condensing. There is an additional layer of liquid which imparts an additional resistance to the flow path. So, therefore, the heat transfer is hindered. In contrast, in drop wise condensation, the condensing vapor ha sees the direct uh, has direct access to the cold wall on which it is condensing. So, the heat transfer efficiency is higher. The drops form after condensation which immediately roll off. This you all know and if I also ask you under what condition uh, the tr there is a transition or what determines uh, a drop wise whether you are going to have a drop wise condensation or a film type condensation. Some of you might also say that well if we have a rough surface we will get drop wise condensation, if we have a smooth surface we will get a film type condensation. The answer is absolutely correct, but the moment you actually talk about a rough surface you are essentially talking about the what we talked above. It is essentially a combination of the surface energy of the surface on which condensation is occurring along with the roughness or which can be in the form of presence of regular or disordered structures which lead to uh, whether you are going to have a drop wise condensation and film type condensation. So, I am sure immediately you realize that these type of patterns what we are going to talk subsequently or what we are talking here has some significance to the engineering knowledge you have already received. So, we will look into these type of surface uh, related issues in greater detail. Moving on, uh, many of the not only the leaves of plants, but many of the insects also have uh, extraordinary exhibit extraordinary capabilities which are also attributed to the presence of uh, structures. For example, there is this uh, fishing spider uh, that is uh, the biological name is written there. I am sorry I cannot pronounce it properly. So, what these spiders do? that they, they, they go on fishing. So, they just dive deep into the water pool. Okay. So, they have something called plastrons which are hairy structures as you can see here in these images along their uh, uh, along their uh, these arms. So, once they decide to dive in the uh, pool these plastrons sort of sort of uh, form an air pocket around these uh, insect completely. So, what it does it, it dives, but it is sort of encapsulated in an air chamber. So, though you know that only a fish can breathe in uh, deep in water, it sort of carries with it an artificial environment of uh, oxygen and it can breathe normally and can spend prolonged time uh, uh, in deep in water. Similarly, pro, uh, many of you probably have heard about uh, the insect water strider which sort of can walk over water. water. Uh, it sort of performs a gravity defying walk over water and it turns out that it has some uh, long legs or arms which show that uh, there are some uh, uh, micro textured citae uh, uh, and, and some nanoscale grooved structures on the cita which actually acts as water repellent. So, this uh, forms a very complex contact line with water thereby sort of uh, reducing the effective gravitational influence on, on the insect uh, so that it does not drown on water and it can sort of walk. So, in and around us there are various examples in the animal kingdom as well where uh, pattern surfaces uh, or patterns provide some extraordinary properties. 
uh, you are free to look into this uh, reference which I have put up at the bottom of this slide. It is available free on the uh, internet. So, you can just download or you can write to me, I will be happy to share it with you. Uh, moving on, there are simpler examples where super hydrophobic surfaces are used. One such example which all of I am sure most of you are aware with is the so called non-stick cookware, uh, which is used in many of our homes. Have you, if you have ever really worried to look into what makes it non-stick as compared to a regular tawa or uh, we use, it actually turns out that uh, it contains a layer of Teflon. Uh, teflon, some of you might be knowing is one of the lowest surface tension materials available to a uh, known to mankind as of today and it is this particular layer which sort of uh, restricts anything that is that can be oil or any other food stuff to adhere or to stick to these surfaces well. So, it sort of uh, comes off easily. Uh, you might also see if you buy a non-stick cookware there is a that a, a foam that ac accompanies the cookware and which says that never scrub this non-stick cookware with anything other than this foam. The warning actually is given so that by way of scrubbing it hard with something else like a brush, you do not spoil the Teflon coating. Uh, it turns out that these uh, Teflon layer also has some tiny microstructures which sort of uh, aids to the uh, level of the or ease of detachment. We will talk about these things in greater detail in lectures to come. Well, uh, you see that ship, submarine, aircraft, everything is painted, but these paints are completely different than the paint we use for, for example, painting our walls and buildings. Uh, ships and submarines are always painted with hydrophobic paint because of the fact that parts of uh, ship and almost entire part of the submarine remain submerged. So, you really do not want water to sort of uh, really stick onto the surface uh, very preferentially because, the, because of the simple fact that there might be significant microbial growth or growth of uh, marine uh, algae and uh, animals on the surfaces of these vehicles. So, that is a major area. Uh, aircraft bodies also have a hydrophobic paint, actually ice phobic paint that is a new term that is being coined by some of the researchers because commercial aircrafts fly at altitudes varying between 35,000 feet to 40,000 feet where the temperatures can be easily between minus 50 to minus 70 degrees centigrade. So, there is a significant chance of ice condensing on the surface of water uh, of the aircraft which is dangerous from the standpoint of navigation and in order to avoid that uh, these uh, special type of paints are given to aircrafts also. Uh, there are various open questions in this area. One of them is on the durability of submerged hydrophobic surfaces. That is if a surface, if a hydrophobic surface remains underwater for a long time, does it remain hydrophobic or it loses part of its hydrophobicity? These are questions which are still open, which are extremely relevant to the industry and, and there are various uh, industrial market or products uh, which are coming up or are soon going to come up based on these considerations. Uh, talking about self cleaning surface, it is something very similar to a structural super hydrophobic surface. Here the idea is that you have a patterned or a textured surface. So, when, when the dust particles which are responsible for dirt or whatever, they try to settle on the surface because of the structures present, you can see here that these dust, dust particles do not adhere to the surface as well. So, the adhesion itself is restricted, the presence of the pattern hinders the adhesion of any dust particle to the surface and when a water sort of uh, is, is water drop is flown over such a surface, that water drop picks up this loosely adhering dust particles. So, a self cleaning surface sort of combines the uh, two effects of structural super hydrophobicity or the so called lotus leaf effect which allows a drop to roll over roll uh, freely over a surface and then it also does not uh, allow dust particles to sort of settle down uh, onto on the surface and uh, have a greater degree of adhesion. One thing you might be interested to know or it might be it might sound interesting to you that uh, is that a dust typically has a size, uh, dust particle typically has a size somewhere varying between uh, 40 to 400 micron. So, eventual idea even if you look at the schematic, one of the key thing is that the features we have to make are smaller than the dust particle, so that the particle does not have complete or full contact with the surface. Uh, many of you I am sure, this is a photograph from the city of Chicago. Uh, many of you are, we us are used to seeing high rise buildings that come with glass facades which are very, very shining almost mirror like which look very beautiful. Uh, have you ever thought how they remain so shining? You really do not see somebody going up every day and wiping it. Well, most of these type of uh, glass uh, 
uh, blocks that are used for making these facades actually contain a self-cleaning layer so that it does not allow the dust to settle uh, preferentially as well as if it is if some water is sprinkled from the top the water sort of reaches down all the way taking off whatever is present on the surface. So this is uh, self-cleaning surfaces and super hydrophobicity is indeed uh, one of the key areas of uh, patterning, key application areas of patterning where a lot of activity or lot of where the patterns we make find a lot of application and we will soon see that uh, 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 artificially creating such uh, structures are extremely important. The second aspect I would like to draw your attention is somewhat related to optics where patterns uh, have play a significant role and again let us pick up an example what we see every day around us. If you hold a compact disc or a DVD in your hand, on the back side of it you see a rainbow color. I am sure all of you have seen it, but I now want to ask you how many have, how many of you have thought why this rainbow coloration forms? Because there is, uh, I mean why all of a sudden? In nature if we see rainbow, it is only after a rainy day under specific condition and only at one area. But you hold a CD or a DVD, you see all the seven colors that constitute uh, white light. As it turns out, which is clear from this schematic, that CD, if you look into the structure of a CD, it actually has a single spiral track that sort of uh, unwinds from the center to the periphery. And uh, the gap between two adjacent turns of the spiral is of the order of 1.5 microns and which are separated. Uh, by a valley between them or a separa separation distance between them of roughly 750 nanometer. So, if you investigate a surface of a, a piece of a CD under a microscope, uh, the gap between two adjacent turns is much, much smaller as compared to the radius of curvature of the CD and eventually under a microscope they appear as parallel lines. Now, what happens is when visible light falls on such a surface, a specific phenomena occurs which is known as diffraction. I am sure all of you know what is reflection and what is refraction uh, of light, but this is the third phenomena which, which goes by the name diffraction of light which also occurs, which actually is the key phenomena that results in the formation of this rainbow color. Now, if you look at any standard physics textbook, textbook you will find that diffraction refers to various phenomena which occur when a wave, in this case optical wave, encounters an obstacle and its effect are generally most pronounced for waves where the wavelength is roughly similar to the, di to the dimension of diffracting objects. So, simply put what happens is you have a structure like this onto which light is coming, visible light is coming and you may be knowing that the wavelength of visible light is varies between 400 to 700 nanometer. Now, here we talk about a uh, valley which is something of the order of 750 nanometer wide. Uh, so, if, we, if the light is falling from an angle, what happens is that part of the sum of the waves actually get into the light, in, into the valley, some of the waves sort of get blocked off because of the confinement effect or the lateral confinement effect or the size. So, part of the light gets reflected from these areas while part of the light gets reflected from these areas. This is a very simplistic view, but you can understand that this structure, the presence of the surface structure like this sort of splits up the light in the form that some of the wavelengths are allowed to penetrate all the way up to here and some of the pen wavelengths are sort of blocked here. That is also one of the reason if you tilt a CD, the uh, rainbow coloration or the location of the rainbow color continuously changes. So, this is uh, something that occurs exclusively due to the presence of the structures or the patterns uh, on the surface and uh, what is important to note that this structure, this is what is known as structural color, but what is important to note that this structural color is not limited to CD or DVD, but again in the biological creatures and animal kingdom there is a huge, huge application or huge, uh, I mean structural colors are seen hugely uh, in, a, in a big way. For example, the brilliant color you see in the butterfly wings, uh, many of you probably do not know that it is, it is to a large extent due to structural color. Okay. So, butterfly, peacock, these type of things, the coloration or the, the ordered coloration, the regular beautiful patterns or the colors you see. In many cases, I would not say it is purely due to structural color, but it is a combination of pigment based color and structural color. For example, the blue color you see behind me 
is actually a color which is pigment based color. It's not related, it's a particular dye that has been given to the cloth or the uh, plastic facade that is up there and that is, the, that is responsible for color. So essential idea is that when you add a desired pigment and white light falls onto it, what happens it, it absorbs pretty much all the other wavelengths ad, which do not correspond to the blue light. So the only the wavelength corresponding to the blue light gets reflected from that surface and all other wavelengths are preferentially absorbed giving it the impression of a blue color. So pigment based color you can see is also related to optics but it is related to the phenomena of optical absorption. In contrast structural color is related to the phenomena of optical diffraction. Now the color does not uh, Structural color, I mean why insects really or insects or animals, uh, many of them rely on structural color is one of the key advantages that structural color uh, allows insects to do camouflage on demand. Because in the animal world, you must realize the entire dynamics resolves around the concept of predator and prey. So when uh, something is trying to catch its food, it would try to sort of remain as much camouflaged as possible from the uh, insect or animal it is targeting to attack. Similarly, when something feels that it is going to be attacked, it also tries to uh, sort of pick up colors or uh, camouflage it to the maximum possible extent uh, so that uh, the other thing that wants to uh, sort of attack it does not feel its presence. Uh, you also know that many of the animals have extrasensory powers like dogs for example have extremely good smelling abilities, snakes can uh, pick up vibration and so on and so forth. But these are some of the additional instincts animals have and uh, some of the additional instincts are also due to the presence of the structural color which are attributed to the presence of uh, ultrafine features on their surfaces. The classic, classic example here is what we all get fascinated as children. Uh, is about the existence of the sh chameleons uh, which we know that they can change the color based on uh, the situation. Well, it is not that that it can change colors to all sorts of uh, colors, but they do have a range of range over which they, they do uh, change their colors. It can vary between blue to green to brown probably. Uh, chameleons if you know it is a variety of slow moving lizards that change color and probably its need to change the color lies in the fact that it is slow moving. So it probably cannot move as fast as other reptiles can move. So in order to sort of not getting eaten up or by getting attacked by other bigger animals, it probably relies on changing its color so that it can match the immediate surrounding. And now it turns out based on extensive research that there are ultrafine features on the, on the skin of these uh, lizards which depending on the stimuli, what type of situation it is subject to they can uh, sort of change the orientation to, to somewhat extent and it is a combination of the pigment based effects as well as uh, the structures present which allows them to tailor the color. In a very recent work uh, from a group uh, of scientists at Cambridge, uh, they came up with something very, very interesting which changed the perception about how animals uh, or particularly the insects visualize. We all know that the insects have compound eyes, uh, is, uh, so they have, uh, so it is a multiple number of images that uh, forms uh, in there and so eventually they can have a wider view, it is like a wide view camera, wide angle camera. But what was recently shown that the uh, insects in many cases do not recognize pigment based color as we do. So we would term a uh, flower uh, rose is red because we see that it is red, but it turns out that the insects can recognize the structures associated to that. So simply put an experiment of something like this was done. So some set of beetles were trained uh, for a uh, particular red flower and what the scientists did, they, they replicated the structure of that red flower uh, on some polymer and then these beetles, these uh, structured surface was illuminated red and in a, in a uh, area where there were various types of flowers and structure uh, leaves and plants, the beetles were allowed to get in and they could recognize those artificially created surfaces which also have the similar structure as compared as was present in the original red flower onto which they were trained. So that showed that they did recognize uh, the red color. But what was more interesting is when in a subsequent experiment, 
these uh, artificially created structures which corresponded to the red flower was artificially illuminated in other color, let us say blue or green. The set of beetles when they were allowed to enter the experimental chamber, they were migrating to the same structure, though now it was appearing to be green or blue, but which had the structures similar to the red, red uh, flowers. So, this is very exciting in the sense that uh, not only, so this shows that structural color is not only due to surface patterns, but insects probably have their vision or their sense of color based on structural color. So, which was a very significant discovery and it was published in the top notch scientific journal of science very recently in 2009. So, to sum up uh, on structural color in many cases, the color is a combined effect of pigmenting and diffraction. And of course, there is a lot of research that is going on on artificial, artificial structural color where the utility of pattern surfaces or making patterns at the desired length scale become important. Of course, uh, there are various other optical applications where, where pattern surfaces find extensive, uh, extensive uh, utilization. For example, holograms, some of you if you care to look at your credit card or de bank debit card uh, close to the visa or master sign, you will find that there is a, something is shining. That is exactly a hologram what a hologram is. Uh, the other important thing, very interesting phenomena is the so called moth eye effect, which is uh, known as the anti reflection effect because moth eyes are special if you shine light on them nothing reflects back. So, that, that is also very, very important and you can see it in this uh, frame. So, here is a glass slide which the somebody is holding and you can pick up that the lights, the lights in the room some images of that you can see. So, part of whatever illuminating light is falling on this glass it is getting reflected. But here again if you very carefully see a glass slide is being held, but which has a coating of anti reflective coating and so you can see almost nothing gets reflected. So, these type of coatings anti reflective coating, anti glare coating, highly reflective coating these type of coatings are extremely useful in various optical application and now the more and more there are uh, research uh, orientation of creating these type of coatings based on patterns. Another important thing you can uh, do a Wikipedia search or an internet search is on optical waveguide. Uh, which also is uh, something very interesting that confines the propagation of light inside a medium and optical waveguides uh, <coughs> are uh, extremely important in uh, uh, optical commu uh, 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 communication based on optical signals as well as uh, sensors based on optical properties. So, all these development in all these areas really require artificial patterns with uh, some micron lateral length scale to be fabricated. Uh, well, this is something I briefly touched about. Uh, earlier the probably the one of the most major thing that is going to come up not in not very distant future is probably the uh, development in the area of metamaterials. Uh, I do not know how many of you are aware of this uh, particular area, but it is something really exciting almost similar to science fiction. Metamaterials promise that they are going to make cloaking possible. Uh, so, essential idea is these, these materials are known as negative refractive index material. So, essential idea is that he, if you look into this particular schematic carefully, what you see that the light waves that are coming can be bent in a desired fashion, oh sorry, uh, so that uh, it does not pass through this particular area. Now, if I stand in front of you, you, own, you will see my or you will recognize my existence because of the fact that you are unable to see what is there behind me. Now, suppose if something can be done so that the light signal that is coming from the back sort of bypasses me completely and then goes to your eyes again, you are going to miss me out. So, suppose if I stand in this particular domain and this is the background you have and you are standing here. So, what is what the this structure is going to make is it is going to bypass me preferentially. And this can be achieved with the with what is being uh, uh, termed as an extremely exotic development or uh, which are termed as metamaterials. Now, the state of art as of uh, now in the uh, metamaterials is that at microwave frequency uh, cloaking has already been achieved. There are certain scaling issues associated with the property primarily the permittivity and other uh, properties of the material which are being used for metamaterials which are still hindering its development for visual light, vi, uh, for visual way, uh, for the visible wavelength of light, but I guess uh, significant research is progressing in that particular direction. So, the possible development of metamaterials is entirely also entirely attributed uh, to uh, 
the structured surfaces or patterns. Uh, moving on, we come to the third example where again from nature and which again people are trying to artificially replicate is on the concept of reusable super adhesive. Uh, one of the key example of this we see every day around us is the walking gravity defying walk of a lizard climbing a vertical wall. right? So, if you think carefully what is the lizard doing? The firstly, the lizard has some mechanism that allows it to stick to the wall. So, it does not fall due to gravity because if you and I try to do the same we will fall off, uh, but then the lizard moves on. So, it is not that it is permanently sticking. So, it moves on. So, first it sticks somewhere and then it detaches itself and then moves to the next location. Now, if you use a cello tape once for example, an adhesive tape, what you can see that maybe first time it sticks well, you take it off, try to stick it at for the second time, it may stick or it may not stick. Chances are that it may not stick and third time onwards definitely it will go bad. So, what is the problem? A cello tape is a reasonably good adhesive, but it is an once use adhesive. Okay. Now, suppose uh, the lizard has an extremely good adhesive uh, in, in, in its legs or something like that, uh, but I mean after uh, using 4 or 5 times it goes bad. So, eventually that would mean that every lizard would essentially can walk uh, 5 times in its life and then it will perish, but that does not happen. So, it sort of not only adheres to the surface extremely tightly that allows it to defy gravity, but then it, it again uses its legs again and again and again to sort of perform uh, its work. It, it can climb wall vertically, it can, it can uh, hang on to the ceiling, you all know that. So, the clue is that it is not only a super adhesive, it is a reusable adhesive and as it turns out that these are non-viscous adhesives uh, uh, as compared to most of the adhesives we use. If you take gum for example, it is a liquid, so it is a viscous adhesive and the adhesion is achieved due to what is known as viscous dissipation. So, you just uh, stitch it uh, and then uh, uh, eventually uh, you lose some energy in the form of viscous dissipation and at the cost of which you achieve the adhesion. Uh, now, this bio inspired concept of uh, artificial adhesives is entirely based on uh, the existence of surface structures or let us say deformable soft surface structures and uh, significant recent work is actually going on in artificially mimicking these structures. So, these are again some examples where uh, uh, textured surfaces uh, can be used and subsequently we will talk of other areas in which uh, pattern surfaces can be uh, used. I will stop here.